Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Idea Podcast, a show that welcomes inclusion, diversity, and embracement to all. This podcast is brought to you by the Social Justice Ambassadors Program and MCTV. I am your host, Patrick Ibanez. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gerald Hussain, and I'm your co-host. And we are both your social justice ambassadors. Yes. <laughs> and today, we all are going to explore the subject of inclusivity and decolonization. Oh, yes. So, Patrick, would you like to do the honors of introducing the subject of inclusivity? Oh, most definitely. Thank you. So, today, oh, wait, actually, we have a TikTok video that explains inclusivity better. Okay. Show it. Mike and Ike's. There are oranges, lemons, grapes, strawberries, and many others. Each flavor is different from one another, but they all taste like fruits nonetheless, except lemon. Lemons taste disgusting and should not be part of the pact. They are too sour and ruin the flavor of the others. No, they don't. They may be sour, but that's what's unique about them. Their differences give them that flavor that stands out from the rest. You may not like them personally, but that doesn't mean you should exclude them. In the end, they are all sweet little things. <laughs> now that was quite interesting, and I happen to like lemon Mike and Ice, just so you know. Um, but before we uh, discuss uh, what's in the video and so forth, um, Patrick, let's interview our guests and, and, and introduce you some and get into this discussion of inclusivity. Yeah, definitely. So today we are lucky to have two guests in our podcast. I want to first introduce Melanie Claros. So Melanie Claros is a Montgomery College student pursuing a business associate's degree with plans of transferring to the University of Maryland at the University of Shady Grove. While at USG, she plans to pursue her education <laughs> as a marketing major. Over the past two years at MC, she has been on the Dean's List for each semester. She's become a vocal student in the Southern Management Leadership Program, a member in the Achieving the Promise Academy, and joined two honor societies, Phi Theta Kappa and Alpha Beta Gamma Honor Society. Thanks. Uh, and I want to take the honors of introducing our other co-host, Dr. Katya Salmi. Uh, she is an assistant uh, professor at Montgomery College where she has been teaching sociology for, I believe, the past three and a half years, if I got that right. And she has served as an adjunct faculty for approximately that long as well. She attended Sussex University, where she earned her Doctor of Philosophy and Sociology degree. Additionally, she has a master's degree in human rights from UCL, London's Global University, and a bachelor's degree at history of history and anthropology from the University of Toronto. At this point, I was going to try to speak my French, but I don't want to go with that. <laughs> According to one of her students, however, uh, who asked, spoke on a, 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 being anonymous, she says that Dr. Salmi is an excellent professor. Uh, she gives great feedback, and it's always clear on what's expected from her students. Uh, she also heads the Montgomery County Social Justice Ambassadors Project, so as you can see, while we have her as a guest here. I want to welcome both of our guests, Dr. Kelmi, Dr. Salmi and our other guests as well. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Thank you for so, having me. So, Melanie, Dr. Salmi, I would love to hear your general thoughts on the TikTok that was just shown. Well, I think the TikTok was very fun and easy to watch and understand. I think it clearly depicts what it means to embrace differences and to see what they bring to the table, even if others don't like it. And I just love how um, people these days, especially the youth, they just are so adept at using social media and figuring out a way to get the message across mm -hmm. in a very easy way to digest so that they can reach more people and pass along that message. Well, thanks. Uh, given those that feedback, let's now turn our attention to the subject of decolonization. And what does it mean and how do we, I guess, bring this this about in our everyday life? Or more particularly, how do we bring it about in our collegiate experience? So Patrick, uh, I'd like for our, our guests, and our, I'd like for you and our guests to talk about this idea. And I understand that you did a great little, what I'm gonna call, interview of the 
students on Montgomery County campus and sort of asked them what did they think of decolonization? What did that turn out to be? The interview? Yes. Oh, well, we have a video. Oh, well, then roll it, as they would say. <laughs> I do not know the meaning of decolonization. So, unfortunately, I don't know what decolonization is. I'm a little sheltered when it comes to stuff like that. Actually, I don't really know what decolonization means. I don't even know how to say the word, so that's a problem. No, I don't know what decolonization means. Decolonization is when a country gains independence from another country, and usually um, it, 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 it adopts it, its own culture, and maybe, maybe two cultures mix and stuff. So decolonization is the process whereby a country gains independence from another country that subdued them. That's what I think decolonization is. Huh. That's very interesting. <laughs> but Professor Daryl, or Daryl, um, I know you have a very interesting definition of what decolonization is. I guess that's not why you call me professor, so I can give an <laughs> academic response. So here it goes. Let's see if I can try that. Um, what I'm going to do is try to explain it from the standpoint of a podcast, or actually a, a it was a, uh, what do you call it when it was not the podcast, when it was on, the, on, on, on written out. But basically, it was in March 2017 when the Indigenous Corporate Training Group came out with um, this definition. And here's what they said. Decolonization was once viewed as the formal process of handing over the instruments of government and is now recognized as a long-term process involving the bureaucratic, cultural, linguistic, and psychological divesting of colonial power. That's the formal definition as far well as I know it. Huh, Daryl, that is a very academic definition. But let's translate something, let's translate this into something easier that's understandable, perhaps through a skit. Okay, let's metamorphosize and become actors. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, here we are in land of indigenous with our indigenous people and our indigenous resources and our indigenous food, everything that we've grown from our own. I love this land with all its resources. This is happy land of indigenous. Oh, what is this here? Oh, I never had this before. We have some spaghetti and meatballs and mac and cheese and frijoles. Oh, look at this amazing food. I haven't seen this in my life. The queen is gonna love this, and the queen is gonna love me. Ooh, I have to take a picture of this for documentation. Cheese. What's that? Oh. Oh, oh, well, that's crazy. I didn't know that you were here. Um, well, since I already have my resources, I can build my kingdom. It's okay, I'll just keep my resources. You can go somewhere far west. It's all right. Cheese. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I would like our guests to share their opinions on decolonization or the skit as to whether that is decolonization or if it entails it or if there's something more to it. All right, thank you. Um, well, I love this kit. Uh, for me, it sounded more like a description of colonization and kind of the coming mm -hmm. in and taking of the resources and not really uh, being aware or, or observant or not caring that somebody was there uh, first. So mm -hmm. um, I appreciate the visualization that you both put together because sometimes people think that colonization is in the past and um, it's not something that we need to think about. But so if a land or peoples have been colonized, then what is the decolonization process? And as uh, Daryl explained earlier, it's kind of like the removal of that process, of that kind of political, economic, social control over that indigenous population. Yeah, and to add on, I think you guys represented colonization perfectly. Patrick, you could depleted his resources and his opportunities completely, uh, and that's pretty much what it is. So I think it was very great. You guys executed it very well, and obviously, I'm hoping that he takes back his resources or some. <laughs> I do too. Well, I, I guess thank you so much for that answer, and I was a little dismayed about taking my, some of my resources. <laughs> we'll have a question about that later on. Um, so, and I think, um, Dr. Sami, you did a great job in terms of having us better understand colonization versus decolonization. 
So in my opinion, I think decolonization is about pretty much cultural, psychological, economic uh, freedom uh, for indigenous people uh, with the goal of achieving indigenous sovereignty uh, and the right for them to actively self-govern themselves and their land and their cultures and their political and economic systems. What so, about you? Hmm. I did want to ask you, why should we understand and embrace decolonization? Well, I'm going to borrow from our guests here. Let's first look at colonization and understand what it is, and then we'll look at the opposite of that. So it's my understanding when we talk about colonization, we're really speaking about colonization from a Western colonization definition, uh, whereby I believe in the, the 1500s, colonization from the Western here begins. And then we see a new neocolonialism, -colon well, uh, say that word twice, um, in the 1960s where the former European colonies in Africa particularly uh, were gaining their independence. So it describes this continuing relationship between Western colonies and former colonies and how they have been have this ongoing global project of how they're going to be governing themselves. So that's what I'm thinking of as colonization would be. But I would like to defer some of that if I'm getting this correctly to some of our guests. What do you think of that in terms of colonization and decolonization? Thank you for that question. I think that, um, you know, just like colonization was something that was like way, way back, uh, decolonization is still an ongoing process. And people need to think, remember that there continue to exist colonies today. Uh, colonies continue to exist. The U.S. has occupied territories um, like Guam, like Puerto Rico, you know, so unequal distribution of resources, of materials, and political power especially. So decolonization, in my opinion, is still a very important process. And particularly within a higher education setting like uh, here at Montgomery College, we really need to think about how we um, relate to decolonization and colonization. How are our institutions, our policies, um, how are they embedded with colonial attitudes and ideas? And what can we do to dismantle colonial approaches, especially in how they impact our students, our faculty, our staff? Yes, definitely. And from what I'm hearing from the colonization part is that settlers continue to occupy land, dictate political, social, and economic sectors, and exploit the indigenous people and the resources. And this is a global endeavor. Yes, that's, that's true. Uh, if, um, if mankind, let me use this phrase to sort of, sort of catch it. If mankind were to practice a universal truth of treating others as one would treat themselves, or let's broaden that to say, a truth to say that one will treat others and include others in a way they would treat and include themselves, then colonization as we know it conceptually should wither and give way to what the concept we call decolonization. Yes, that is very insightful, Daryl. And I wanted to ask you too, how do you define decolonization? I would, yeah, thank Go you. Ahead. I would define it very simply and just say equal opportunities for all people. And I would add to that, um, and thank you, Melanie, for mm -hmm. that definition, but I would also say that decolonization um, is really about that dismantling process mm. um, and I b again in my opinion <laughs> I believe it also involves uh, redistribution and some could argue reparations or resettlement or um, you know if we're going to really think about the implications of the harmful impact that colonization had on peoples and land so um, Decolonization, I think, is an ongoing process that it needs to be continued and that should allow people to have an equal say and equal opportunities, but also address the inequalities that were created through colonization. Wow, okay. That, that broads this script a bit. So let's add a follow-up question to that. Um, here's my, my follow-up question. Uh, in your humble opinions, and all your opinions are very humble and very straightforward, I appreciate that, and based on the facts as you know it, so what does or should decolonization look like in everyday life? Um, how will we particularly manifest itself on our college campus? We can use Montgomery College as an example. Well, I would say here that Montgomery College, I think one way that we could 
spread this uh, process of decolonization is that maybe we can educate ourselves and become more aware of what's going around or in the community. So maybe that would look like gathering up with other students and maybe serving in a volunteer project that could help with those in need or we could just do a podcast as we're doing right now and just <laughs> you know talk about it and educate ourselves and others about it and um, also that open-mindedness of knowing of others people other people's backgrounds and culture and and what they may may experience rather than what you may experience that's a great answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will add also, I think, you know, one is really that awareness and education piece is crucial. Um, one thing, really basic thing that people can do is learn about whose lands we are on. Mm -hmm. We are on stolen land. Uh, we work on stolen land. I live on stolen land, you know, and, and we can't really forget that. It's really easy to go through our everyday lives just kind of um, doing what we do, but uh, ne we need to think about it, acknowledge it, and see what steps we can take to um, to play our part in addressing that, whether it's an acknowledgement or maybe we can support indigenous businesses, indigenous artists, and beyond indigenous peoples here, people who have been historically marginalized um, in our society. So thinking about who these groups are. And then at the college level, you know, I think there are different levels that we can work on this question. Students, uh, I mean, amazing students like Patrick and Melanie here, like are working towards these goals and kind of raising awareness and getting that momentum going with their fellow students, I think is hugely important and, and crucial. And then faculty who, can kind of work on this in their courses. Like Daryl's volunteering his time to be a part of this program, the Social Justice Ambassadors Program, working with Patrick. And I really applaud that. And these efforts where we can focus on our individual classes, what we teach, how we teach is something that we can do. And then, but really I think the biggest thing is the institution has to, to commit to this goal, has to commit to it not just in speaking, but also financially and in um, you know, resources to enable the people who are at this school to work on these projects. And, um, and final point I'll add is that I really believe there needs to be an inward look you know, at all levels of the institution to make sure that the institution does not negatively contribute to um, kind of impacting indigenous communities, marginalized communities, and seeing what we can do, what we can change within ourselves to, to, to help this overall goal of decolonizing higher education. Oh, yes, thank you, Dr. Salmi. That was very, very, what's it called? In depth. <laughs> Very inclusive. <laughs> 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 Most definitely. I, I really liked how you very broadened your answer and how you went into the specifics as well. But for Daryl, in your opinion, what does or could decolonization look like in everyday life on the college campus? Wow, that's a, a okay. I, I guess I'm gonna give my answer based on some research, but before I do that, I'm gonna give a little synopsis of what I've tried to do in my own classes. Uh, what I do, as every class starts, I play music from around the world. Prior to that, I get the students' background. So before they start class, the, the course, I send them an email saying, hey, where are you from? Where's your family from? All these different questions. I also give an example where I'm from, my background. And so I just sort of play the music without them noticing kind of thing. And I had the greatest reaction one time. And it was when one of my students said, hey, 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 she's pl he's playing my music. It's from my country. Da, 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 da. Issues from Senegal. Uh, and it was great. I had her pretty much clued in all day in that class, so she paid attention. So I think when, I, when I'm talking about is um, pretty much trying to be inclusive and trying to, as, as you guys have alluded to, is reaching out and understanding where we are, where, we, where we're going, uh, wh what people's backgrounds are, and how we can pay homage to both their backgrounds as well as to where we are and sort of bring that to the classroom. And not necessarily in a way where we're hitting them over the head, but in a very nonchalant way, not too intrusive, but just, just a part of the class kind of thing. So I think that's the way I would pretty much answer that question. Oh. Thank you, Daryl. Well, in my opinion, decolonization is as simple as providing opportunities to households who lacked opportunities in the past. So let's say this chip right here represents an opportunity, and Melanie settled into this land, and she named it Melanie Land, <laughs> right? And since Melanie established like her own like system of governance, 
um, she's able to thrive off opportunities, right? She was able to establish schools so Melanie and her family can go there. Um, with school, she got a nice education, and with an education, she's able to get a job. Ooh, <laughs> Lost a resource. Almost next time. <laughs> <laughs> start an opportunity, and then start a family, because starting a family, it's a great opportunity. And then sooner or later, Melanie's family would benefit off this, having money for investments, enough to get like a nice big house, live that American dream. <laughs> She's Almost. overfilled with, with, with resources here. Most definitely. <laughs> and she's practically benefiting, benefiting off the system, per se. And this opportunities like grows exponentially, which only benefits Melanie's family, her people, her generation, rather than us who are also settling in the land. And that's what I think decolonization, that's what I think colonization is. However, for what I think decolonization is, it would be Melanie and her family and her generations who benefited off the system. They would have to sacrifice those opportunities so everyone can have an equitable standing, mm. politically, economically, and socially. So Melanie, can you decolonize your situation right now? Of course. Thank you. Oh, great. Right? Ooh. So what Melanie is doing is that she's we spreading off the opportunities, right? So we will all have a nice, equitable standing. Oh, <laughs> don't forget <laughs> your opportunities as well, Melanie. Oh, oh yes, I missed. Don't worry. Oh, I you have already have two. <laughs> oh, so that's what I think decolonization is. Well, thank you for decolonizing those chips. Next <laughs> time I'm going to ask for some some dip to go along with it, preferably avocado dip. <laughs> oh, Thank you. Dale, uh, I wanted to ask those two, do you have a, a matter of say? <laughs> uh, do you have, what, what are your opinions on my demonstration? Well, I think it's always helpful to have a visual of, of these issues because sometimes people, you know, they hear these, these big words and some, you know, sometimes we can't even say them ourselves like it's a mouthful, decolonization, neoliberalism, inequalities and all these things. And so if you just present it kind of in a, in a visual way, you can maybe reach more people. And I think that it's a, you did, what I liked about what you did is how you show us that decolonization, you know, we're not taking everything away from Melanie, because Melanie still has so many opportunities, um, but it's about how we can redistribute in resources in a more equitable way, and by, you know, kind of all of us having a chance to have access to those resources. What did you think, Melanie? I think that was perfectly said. Uh, you know, I'm happy to redistribute my opportunities with everyone around me, uh, and I just really liked that, that example. Thank you. Well, I liked it too, especially I got my chips. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if we were to sum up decolonization, I, I think I would add it these three components. Uh, one, restoring the indigenous worldview, that redistributing part of it. Uh, restoring culture and traditional ways, again, redistributing some cultures that you may have trampled over and sort of put off to the wayside. And then third, adding this indigenous viewpoint or perspective of history in a way that it becomes equal to a Western uh, interpretation of history. So I want our guests and our audience to see this picture I just painted, as well as uh, a pine on whether or not, and I guess maybe you've done so well so far, but I'll ask you further, uh, whether this depiction of decolonization, what do you think about that? Is there any other thing that we need to explore about that? Hmm, that's very interesting, but I kind of want to share my definition of decolonization. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be <laughs> an inclusive there. Uh, Oh no, it's okay. So from what I think decolonization is, it's probably shifting the way indigenous people view themselves as well as also how non-indigenous people uh, view indigenous people. That's a very inc insightful thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry I wasn't inclusive earlier. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> as we sort of bring this pod class to a, a pod, pod class, podcast, <laughs> I'm thinking of class, huh? Uh, what words or wisdoms um, or any uh, pondering thoughts uh, we can leave with our audience to further sort of discuss uh, this topic amongst ourselves. I mean, I want to open this open to all our guests. Any last words that you want to sort of leave to our audience about this subject and anything beyond that? Well, before this conversation with you all, I never sat down and spoke with anyone about decolonization. I always knew about it. I always heard about it in the back of my mind. Uh, so after this, I definitely do want to embrace this and 
speak to more people about it because I think it's important for them to know um, about this process and how we need to incorporate it more into our everyday lives. And I would add also that um, for people who are just starting out or just thinking about it, that you don't have to do everything in all one go. You know, I think like taking mm. that first step, learning about it, maybe for faculty and staff, they can attend workshops or students can talk to their professors about it or their fellow students. I think it's, it's okay to not accomplish everything, but just taking that first step to start mm. thinking critically about our role in this process of decolonizing is really that the crucial step. Most definitely. And in reference to our talk on inclusivity, I want everyone to embrace their differences as well as embracing other people's differences. Um, because every aspect of ourselves makes us so unique and so beautiful as a person. And those aspects should only unite us as humans rather than divide us as different. What do you think, Dale? Well, I, I would pretty much echo those thoughts as well. I'm going to now refer back to my professor, doctor thing. Oh. And <laughs> <laughs> professor Dara. <laughs> Let me give you this to definition. I actually have to research as well. Uh, it appears as though there's a consortium of scholars, activists and educators who produce various white papers on this very subject. And they can be found in this group I found called the Independence and Global Thinking. Uh, I would suggest we all look at some of these thoughts uh, as well as we discuss these things amongst each other and then from there, we can then determine our better or greater understanding of decolonization. I think it was very apropos to say that you can't digest it all at one point. You have to sort of take it bits and bites, just like those Mike and Ites. I still like those yellow Mike and Ites, though. Uh, so in the spirit of inclusivity, uh, I would like to say this way. In uh, words of uh, decolonization, or rather inclusivity and decolonization, is an ideal and a, a concept to be embraced by all. And that's what we have are a great ideal from. Inclusivity, decolonization, embraced by all. Most definitely. And I want to thank our guests for being so gracious with their times and talents in making this inaugural podcast an idea worth considering and discussing. If you are interested in sharing your experiences with us, then come join us to make inclusion come alive.